Chris is going to give us again in 20 minutes, putting into context the inclusive education that we've been talking about into a wider context of educational reform and what we need to do to change to ensure that many of those issues that we've identified that have been barriers for disabled people and continue to be barriers, what do we need to do in the future to change those barriers? How do we need to, and what do we need to do to change to ensure that the schools and the schooling systems are responding and learning from everybody? Thank you, sir. Well, first, I think, I think the first thing we need to do is to clone Addison and Gareth <laughs> and catapult them into every school in the country. And I don't say that to flatter, but really out of relief that there are these examples of good practice pushing against boundaries in the midst of all this devastation and gloom. So thank you, Gareth, and thank you, Alison. All right, um, you've got a very strict chair. <laughs> And I'm a very obedient fellow, so I try and um, get through all of this in the 20 minutes. The first thing I want to do is to share this quote with you. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you will have the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them. That, even if they didn't know it, has been the mantra of every social movement that I can think about in this country and elsewhere. Um, it is what the disability rights movement was hinged upon, the race equality movement, and all the rest of it, 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 it seems to me. And that is why we are so important, all of us in this room and people like us elsewhere. Okay, so I want to take my cue from the chair, share these propositions with you. Because I believe that what we're really talking about here is a schooling system in this country at least, and in other parts of the world, that has lost its way, in some cases never really defined what it's about or should be about and that we need to reclaim. So as an educationalist, these are the propositions that are dear to my heart. I speak here today um, as a parent of six children, all of whom went to school in this country, um, a former director of education, as you've been told, and it's good to see some old hackneyites here. Welcome all. <laughs> that these things 
need to be to be built upon. This is the third. That whole neoliberal business and looking at education, uh, evaluating education in any country based upon the country's place in the international league table seems to me to be so utterly crass and stupid and ignorant that you can't imagine people in parliament, people in government being so obsessed with that. And that's the fourth one. If it's not about skills for the workplace exclusively, what is it for? I believe it is for these things. Developing in people's skills and competences to take control of their own lives, function as responsible social citizens, demanding and safeguarding their own rights, having due regard to and respect for the rights of others, embracing the responsibilities to, the, to themselves, to families, and to society. Uh, Alison this morning, Gareth a while ago, both made reference to this, what the duty of schools is, especially that last bit. Developing knowledge, understanding, skills to be at ease with and respect themselves so that they can respect others, especially people who are different from themselves. And it seems to me that it, is, it, is, it should be transparently obvious that if one is going to grow awareness of special educational needs, of disability equality and the equal rights of people with disabilities, this has to feature very much in what we do with everybody, and particularly those who are considered to be normal, while others are considered to be other. And this one, the neoliberal agenda that we were talking about before, and concentrating only on the nation's economic competitiveness. I believe that not only people like Michael Gove, the likes of Michael Wilshaw are injurious to the schooling system of this country. And that's what this ideology promotes. The cult of the individual, selfishness, greed, and perhaps worst of all, the idea of the survival of the fittest. And the devil take the hindmost. Okay. Take a look at this quotation from Maggie Atkinson, former Children's Commissioner. In year one of our school exclusions inquiry, we found a boy of black Caribbean heritage with special educational needs, eligible for free school meals, is 168 times more likely to be excluded than a white British girl without SEN from a more affluent family. And if you have not seen that before, I would strongly recommend that you look at these reports that the Children's Commissioner has done on school exclusions. And then these statistics from the DFE's own website 3,900 permanent exclusions in secondary schools in 2012-13 with persistent destructive behavior accounting for 30.8% of all permanent exclusions. In state funded primary schools, exclusions for physical assault against an adult is a slightly more common trigger for a, common, for a permanent exclusion and that accounts for 31.3% of all primary permanent exclusions. And it gets worse. The DFA reports that pupils with special educational needs with and without statements account for 7 in 10 of all permanent exclusions. 
Papers with SEN without statements are around 10 times more likely to receive a permanent exclusion than papers with no SEN. And those with a statement of SEN are around six times more likely to receive a permanent exclusion than pupils with no SEN. Now, this is shocking by any measure. And that's not some university researcher or any one of us saying that anecdotally. This is what the government has aggregated from all the data that it collects. And the question then is this, if you have a statement of special educational needs, and that comes with provision which helps to cater for those needs, why in heaven's name is it necessary to be excluding students at such a rate? Now, we know that all schools need to have regard to the Equality Act of 2010. And they were required to comply with the public sector equality duty of that act during the period covered by these statistics. The requirements of the 2015 guidance, which I'll say a bit more about in a minute, which had to be withdrawn in January it, it, it withdrawn on the 2nd of February because we in CEN and Just for Kids Law threatened to take Nikki Morgan to court if they didn't withdraw it. And Nick Gibb determined that we were right and it should be withdrawn. That requirement, those requirements, and indeed the requirements before then made it very clear that there needed to be compliance with the Equality Act 2010. For disabled children, compliance with the Act includes a duty to make reasonable adjustments to policies and, and practices. So the public sector equality duty means that in carrying out the function, schools must also have regard to the need to eliminate discrimination, harassment, victimization, and any other conduct that is prohibited by the Equality Act. It should have advanced equality, equality of opportunity between people who share protected characteristic <laughs> and people who do not. For example, children with disabilities and those who do not have. Foster good relations between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not. In particular, having due regard to the need to tackle prejudice and promote understanding. And again, that's something that both Addison and Gareth focused upon this morning. So these duties must be taken into account when deciding whether to exclude a pupil. And schools are required to ensure that the policies and practices do not indirectly discriminate against pupils by unfairly placing them at a greater risk of exclusion than others. Those provisions within the Act <coughs> allow schools to take action to deal with particular disadvantages that may affect a specific group, where it can be shown that a reasonable and proportionate way of dealing with such issues is legal, is fair, and make sense in the context of meeting every child's needs. But research conducted by Rota, recently in January 2013, found that many academies and free schools are basically ignoring the Equality Act 2010. Out of 78 free schools they researched, in, and that were opened in 2011 and 2012, only 7.7% had one equality objective. Most of them seem to be totally unaware of the Equality Act 2010. Less than 25% had made any reference to the Equality Act in their key documents and policies, typically posted on their websites. 
But then against that, just look at the rate of exclusions of these academies and free schools. In 2012-2013, a total of 18,763 maintained schools excluded 2,700 pupils. More than 18,500. Yet, only 2,390 academies excluded 1,930 pupils. Only 770 less than all these 18,700 schools. Utterly shocking. Ofsted doesn't seem to have a, a, a problem with that, nor does the Secretary of State for Education. So, five minutes. Why did we have to challenge Nikki Morgan on this? guidance on exclusion that was put out in January, 5th of January this year. The 2012 guidance stated permanent exclusion should only be used as a last resort in response to serious breach or persistent breaches of the school's behavior policy and where allowing the pupil to remain in school would seriously harm the educational welfare of the pupil or others in the school. The decision, the decision to exclude must be lawful, reasonable, and fair. And again, it states, schools have a statutory duty not to discriminate against pupils. <coughs> and particular consideration needs to be given to fair treatment of pupils from groups who are vulnerable to exclusion. And that includes children with special educational needs. Yet the 2015 guidance, on which there was no consultation, had this wording. It is for the head teacher to decide whether a child's behavior warrants permanent exclusion, though no, this is a serious decision that should be reserved for a serious breach or persistent breaches of the school's behavior policy. But note, or where a pupil's behavior means allowing the pupil to remain in school would be detrimental to the educational welfare of the people or others in the school. So whereas before, it was a question of where harm, serious harm, could be done to the welfare of people or others in the school, here they talk about detrimental, lowering the threshold. So let me say something quickly about the access to redress of parents and excluded students. The independent appeal panel existed before the Education Act 2011. Since that act, the IAPs were replaced by independent review panels that no longer have any power to make a governing body reinstate an excluded student. And then, of course, there's a question of the composition of those panels. I represented a young boy, age 13, at a school in the West Midlands recently, at an independent review panel. On that panel was a local head teacher from the same academy chain as a head teacher who had done the exclusion. The SEN expert was the head of the school psychological service. And therefore, the boss of the linked SEMCO, Special Education Needs Coordinator, in the school that had done the exclusion. And, and by my assessment, that special educational needs coordinator was found wanting because she did not insist that that school should go to a, a, a statutory assessment of this child in spite of all that was happening to him and he was clearly in need of some attention. Frankly, he was on the spectrum for Asperger's and he was autistic. All his behaviors were considered to be, because he was bad, 
rather than the fact that he had leaves. So there's a situation where you've got the excluding head, his chair of governors, an SEM expert who's the boss of the special needs coordinator in the same school, and the local head teacher who belongs to the same academy chain as the head teacher that did the exclusion. Which is why Maggie Atkinson reporting to uh, um, Go recommended that they should revert to independent appeal panels and get rid of these independent review panels because the IRP breached Article 13 of the European Convention of Human Rights regarding the rights to a fair trial. It should have taken the commissioner to tell the Secretary of State that natural justice demands it, never mind anything else. And we say, and you see where this quote comes from in a minute, and, and, and I'm concluding now. Um, the one size fits all approach promoted by this system that we have right now with academies, preschools, the over concentration on examination results and not the developmental needs of children creates inflexible classrooms where exclusion is an inevitable feature of the landscape. This narrow focus on continual pressure is not in the best interest of young people and violates Article 3 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, stating that the best interest of children must be the primary consideration of all actions, and it continues. The discontinuity and disruption suffered by excluded pupils violates Article 2 of the Convention that states all rights apply to all children regardless of what they have done, as well as Article 28, which states all children have a right to an education. Exclusion unquestionably curtails these rights. This is taken from a recent report by Christy Coates, who did her PhD, excellent piece of work, on a place in Hackney called Mossbourne Academy, where one Michael Wilshaw used to be before he became chief of Ofsted. Christy did this work, we commissioned, we in CEN commissioned her to do this, and I, I strongly recommend the report to you. Let me conclude by saying just a couple of things. I believe that the, system, the road we are on is a road to disaster. You cannot pattern, fashion, organize, structure a schooling system that is meant, is, 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 is structured to create all of these casualties every single year. Casualties that define people's life and life chances forever. And those same academies that are excluding students at the rate at which I've just described are also being given the mandate. They are being, they are being commissioned to provide pupil referral units. So they kick them out of one door, they invite them into another to make yet more money. And for too many students, those people referral units are nothing but the antechamber of the young offender institution and the graveyard of hopes and aspirations. Now I want to depress you, my friends, but I believe that that sets a very clear agenda for us. Because unless we, we organize ourselves to challenge this and challenge those parents who believe that it is, it is good for their children to understand that that kind of divisiveness doesn't do anybody any harm and their children, even with the 30A stars and 5As or whatever it is, are not going to be safe if the, school, if the schooling system creates all of these casualties and builds the kind of structures the kinds of social disorder in society that is inevitable from this two-track system. Thank you.